Hello, this is Sally Anero from Taylor Wessing. Welcome to our webinar today, which is the last of our webinars in 2014. Today's webinar is part of our webinar program where we bring you expertise and views on topical data protection issues. Our regular attendees will be very familiar with previous topics that we have hosted webinars for over the last few years. And these have included issues such as mobile apps, data transfers, wearable privacy, uh, data security and dealing with breach incidents. Recordings of those webinars are available if you've missed them and still wish to engage on those topics. Today's webinar is looking at the Surveillance Camera Code of Practice and the role of the Surveillance Camera Commissioner. And it's in part a follow-up from the more general webinar that Taylor Westing delivered earlier this year on CCTV, which, which at that time looked at the wider regulatory landscape around uh, closed-circuit television cameras. For those of you who are new to Taylor Westing or to our webinar program, welcome. As you will see from the slide I'm sharing at the moment, Taylor Westing is a leading international law firm. We've listed more details about the firm on this slide deck for your reference. At Taylor Westing, we also have a microsite, which is specifically for all things data protection, which is our global data hub. And from this site, you will be able to access recordings of our webinars, along with weekly news updates and a monthly mail shot, and looking at topical issues that raise concerns, issues, or challenges in the data and data protection related sphere. Today, we are going to be throwing the floor open to a guest speaker, Tony Porter, the Surveillance Camera Commissioner. Tony will be talking about the role of the Surveillance Camera Code. Uh, he will be looking at how uh, the 12 guiding principles in the code uh, encourage the uh, people to promote and respect uh, the use of uh, closed circuit camera systems uh, uh, to ensure that people's uh, rights and privacy are respected. So without further ado, I will pass over to Tony to explain more about the camera code of practice and how to comply with its, with its content. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sally, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar about adopting the surveillance camera code of practice. Uh, I think it's right that before I start, I thank Taylor Wessing for hosting this webinar on my behalf. And I'd also like to thank the Association of University Chief Security Officers for promoting this to their members. This webinar is aimed at people using surveillance cameras in universities and colleges, but I do understand that we've got some people in the audience who are not in that sector. Don't worry and please don't log off because most of what I will cover in this webinar will be relevant regardless of the sector that you work in and it would be easy for you to transfer the benefits that I outline to your own particular sector. <clears throat> I'm going to speak for around 25 minutes and then I intend to answer any questions you send in at the end but you can submit them at any time and any point of the webinar. Uh, there will also be some interactive polls taking place throughout the, pr uh, throughout the presentation, so work, please pay attention. Okay, um, a little bit about the background and history of CCTV. I thought it would be best to start with, with this and outline how surveillance cameras came into the UK. Um, the first publicly viewable television service was launched by the BBC in 1936. This was probably the genesis of CCTV. And just over a decade later in 1947, an innovative Metropolitan Police Superintendent proposed that the force should be able to evaluate the live TV footage of the Royal Wedding to assist with the deployment of patrol officers. Perhaps unfortunately, his entrepreneurship wasn't matched by that of his senior officers and it was refused on cost grounds. But you can start to see the imagination building behind utilizing CCTV. 10 years later, in the late 50s, police forces began to use CCTV to assist in the one-man operation of traffic lights. And by 1960, the Met had erected two pan-tilt zoom cameras in Trafalgar Square. And by the end of 1960, the 1960s, 14 different forces were utilizing CCTV. That's a whopping 67 cameras nationally somewhat pales into its significance, I think you'll agree. But it was during the 60s with the advent of video recorders that the use of CCTV spread to the retail sector to help deter and apprehend shoplifters. 
Now, we all know that during the next two decades, CCTV became a fairly routine feature in security for the retail sector, and there was limited flow in other areas. And for the police, its use remained limited and focused on marginal groups, such as football hooligans and political demonstrators. Now, CCTV could possibly have continued to amble along in this way in the UK if it weren't for one iconic event that changed everything in 1993, and that was the abduction and murder of Jamie Bulger. Now, I'm sure you'll recall the grainy images of Jamie being led away from a Merseyside shopping centre by his two 10-year-old killers. These images were replayed night after night on television and becoming more and more iconic. And whilst they didn't prevent the horrific crime, the images led to the belief that those who carried it out would be caught. And that was, in fact, the case. Now, this single incident did lead to huge funding of public space surveillance camera systems by central and local government, business, and indeed Europe. And between 95 and 98, it's estimated that 85 million funding was secured for 580 schemes. This was effectively the start of the criminal justice CCTV arms race. In 1999, a further 153 million was set aside to support the expansion of CCTV in England and Wales, leading to another 339 schemes being awarded funding. And by the end of 98, the value of UK CCTV market was 361 million annually, having risen from around 100 million in 1991. CCTV was part of the British psyche, hotwired into day-to-day -day life of citizens in the UK. And you know, today it still very much is, and depending on which estimates you look at, there are between two and six million cameras in the UK. And it's said that in any urban area on a busy day, a person could have their image captured by around 300 cameras on 30 different systems. So as you can see, from humble beginnings with limited deployment, the use of CCTV exploded in the 90s and into the 2000s. And much of the rapid expansion was unregulated, or should I say, self-regulated by those in the industry, the likes of CCTV user group and the PCMA, who did a fantastic job without direction and control from the government. And in 2007, there was a national CCTV strategy which was published, which broadly led to the uh, creation of my role as it is today. So, the coalition came into power in 2010 and announced the Protection and Freedoms Bill. It became an act in 2012 and paved the way for my role. Appointed in March by the Home Secretary, and I am independent from government. Now, I've been in post eight months, and it has been a challenging eight months. The role itself was created to ensure that surveillance camera systems are used to support and protect communities, not spy on them. And it was said that it was due to roll back the incursion of the state into the lives of the, of the citizens. Now, to help with this, the Home Office had published a surveillance camera code of practice in June 2013. You will probably know that it contains 12 guiding principles, which if followed will mean cameras are only ever used proportionately, transparently, and effectively. And that is the key. But more of this in a moment. I just want to touch on my background. Um, I started back as a bobber on the beat in Stockport in 1982, finishing my career in the police as commander New Scotland Yard with responsibility for counter-terrorism investigations, actually finishing commanding the 2012 Olympic Games. So the point that I'd like to make is that I do have first-hand experience of how technology such as surveillance cameras are used in both the private and public sector, and how images captured by these devices can be used as evidence and lead to prosecutions, and how they do protect communities. So, surveillance in universities and colleges for many young people going to university or college, it's their first experience of living away from home. For new students, it's probably an exciting and liberating time, free from the shackles of parents and home. I doubt many freshers, however, would give much thought to their safety or who's looking after them. It, it's not really de rigueur. Do they securely lock their laptops, smartphones and tablets away? Is it for, up front and foremost in the consciousness? Not really. Are their doors and windows secure? Is the campus safe and who can you call in an emergency? Now, as I said before, I, don't, I doubt that these sorts of things are on the minds or the minds of the many students until something happens that affects that. However, as a parent of a daughter, 
who's just started university away from home for the first time, actually in a foreign country, her safety is the forefront of my mind. And I bet it is for the hundreds of thousands of other parents whose children are out of sight for the first time. Perhaps even more for the parents of overseas students. They want to know campuses are secure, safe from potential threat. Could a perceived safer university or college see a greater influx of overseas students which may correlate to more funding? So, a well thought out and designed CCTV system can be an excellent weapon in the armour of a university to show that the student's safety is of real importance to them. Those not from universities, whether it's residential social landlords, whether it's commercial retail, you can easily see the transferability of those benefits as can the universities, putting yourself up with the best in terms of security. And perhaps in uh, ter Terrorism Awareness Week, uh, it's perhaps a, a very salient comment. But at the same time, there are privacy issues to consider with high-profile media stories such as Snowden, concerns about surveillance, surveillance technologies, it is never out of the papers. So while CCTV can be the silent guardian that protects our campuses, it can't be at the price of the person's right to privacy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Code of Practice, uh, published by the Home Office last year. Uh, relevant authorities, now there are the police, police and crime commissioners, Local authorities and non-regular police forces must pay due regard to the code. For everyone else, adoption is voluntary. For universities and college, adoption is voluntary. I actually have a question, I will relay this now. Is the code binding? The answer to that is no. Relevant authorities must have regard to the code, which is not the same as having the duty to comply. So the Code of Practice enables the public and communities to hold users of surveillance camera systems to account, to make sure they're being used for their intended purpose and that they don't impinge on an individual's right to privacy. This can be summed up quite succinctly in the terms surveillance by consent, which is a concept that was familiar to me in the police. It means the public consent to being observed where it is a pressing need and it's in their best interests. But this consent is fragile. It's been described to me almost like a law, a terrorism law, that is like a Ming vase. Well, I view consent as fragile in relation to being so fragile. It needs to be consultation about how and where and why cameras are deployed. You only need to lose public faith once. Um, it can wane very quickly. Your communities begin to think they're being looked at rather than looked after. So what's my role? My role is threefold, to encourage compliance with the RUP code, to review the operation of the code, and advise on any amendments to how the code should develop. And uh, I have a burden of reporting annually to Parliament where I provide a comprehensive review and assessment of how the code is being applied and utilised, and indeed whether or not any uh, regulatory or legislative changes need to be considered. And as we approach general elections next year, there is an increasing demand for advice and guidance from ministers in that regard. So I'm going to move on through the codes, which I guess what many of you are thinking, well, what's this all about then? Principles one to four. Now we'll look at the principles in more detail. These first principles are all about the deployment and use of a surveillance camera system. I'm not going to go through them all in minute detail, but I'll give you an overview. For a complete picture, please read the code, which I'm sure you'll already have done. Principle one to four, cover how you deploy and use cameras. Here we want you to really think about the purpose behind a camera or entire system. Why are you installing a camera? What is the pressing need? It could be to prevent antisocial behaviour, protect property, keep your staff safe, or all of these. Carrying out an operational requirement will help you in identifying if camera is the only solution to meeting your needs. So, I guess for example, if there's been a space of criminal activity in a dark, poorly lit alleyway, is the way to curb it by installing a camera? or improving lighting in the area. A complete operational requirement will help you set out the rationale for a camera or camera system and might be helpful if its use is challenged. Now I said earlier cameras should look after, not look at communities. In consenting to be surveilled, individuals do so with an expectation 
that their privacy is not being pinged upon. So here is good practice to carry out a privacy impact assessment any time you install a new camera or move one. This will help you assess if you're inadvertently invading a person's privacy. Let me give you a free example. So when a camera pans, it could pan across, let's say, a window of a student's bedroom. That is a clear intrusion of privacy. A privacy impact assessment will help you find ways to reduce the privacy intrusion to a proportionate level. Signage is also key to a well-run system. The public must be made aware of whenever they're being monitored by a surveillance camera system. The signage must also include a point of contact for a member of the public for raising a query or complaint. Are you confident your systems are well signposted? Where is the signage and is it visible? Do you publish any additional information elsewhere on a website? And finally, on deployment of the cameras, it's important to have a strong governance arrangement in place. Who's responsible for the operation and development of the system? Now, for a university, is it the chief security officer? Is your system used for more than one purpose? So if it's used for, say, traffic management some of the time, public safety for some of the rest, it's then good practice to have clear lines of responsibility for all of the system functions. If there are two organisations with one system, then a memorandum of understanding highlighting the delineation of that function is absolutely key. So, we move on to our polling question. This is uh, the first stage of the interactive element. Um, we're going to have our, this is the first of three. This isn't a trick question. Can I assure you that answers are anonymous, so please do answer. We want to get a feel for how many of your right organisations would meet principle two. The question is, how often do you review your camera system? So please check either A, annually, B, every two years, C, more than every two years, and then press submit, and we'll discuss the results in a moment. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got some answers in. I'm not sure if you can see them, so I'll read them out. Annually, 65%, every two years, 3%, and more than every two years, 32%. Okay, so I think that's a bit of a, a mixed bag, a curious egg. The, the, the ideal position is to review your systems annually. Those who fall outside of that, you may consider some serious opportunities that present themselves to you. Um, I've just visited a local authority that have done a comprehensive annual review against the 12 guiding principles, and as a result of that review, they have recalibrated their systems and brought in cost savings in the tune of 250,000. Um, things change, um, the, the, the requirements change, so I think for at least 34, 35% of the group, there are key opportunities, business benefits that you can bring into play into your respective organization. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. I'll move on. Go to now talk about principles 5 to 12. Pretty much look like good governance arrangements. It's a good practice to have rules, policies and procedures in place regarding the operation of your system. It's useful to have these written down somewhere and available for the staff to refer. They should form part of an induction on any new member of staff the public could also be made aware of your policies to give them reassurance that cameras are being used appropriately. Transparency, that's absolute key. Now I've talked about the principles relating to the installation and governance of the system. I'll look at some principles that cover image capture and retention. Some of this falls into the domain of the Information Commissioner, who I have a memorandum of understanding with. 
They also have just updated their code of practice so it follows what is in mind. It complements it, so if you follow one, you should in theory also be complying with the other. It goes without saying that you shouldn't store images on your system for longer than is necessary. There's no set retention period. It, it may vary from system to system. For CCTV, most of the systems I've seen automatically delete data after 31 days, unless it's been pulled out for use as evidence. For body-worn video, this could be different, and again, different for automatic number plate recognition. It is for you to satisfy yourself that your retention of data is proportionate and deleted when no longer needed. I'm now going to ask a number of challenging questions. Access and disclosure of images and data is also incredibly important. Who is able to access the images your system records? Does your system record an audit trail of who has reviewed or downloaded footage? And also, what is your policy for allowing access to data to law enforcement agencies or others? Actually, you haven't got one. Now, you may want to download a specific segment of footage for police investigation, but I'd ask the question, is it proportionate to download days of footage, download days of footage? Can you pixelate or mask out individuals to protect their privacy? Well, very much the technology is there, so the question has to be, why not if a privacy impact assessment is conducted? Individuals can make a subject access request to view footage that they're in, perhaps following a road traffic incident. But the system operates at the discretion to refuse access to information, unless there's an overriding legal obligation. I just want to touch around standards which Principle 8 in my code relate to. Now, I'm determined to raise standards across the industry, and at the same time, I recognize that they're voluntary. But in adopting a standard, it raises you above the others in your sector. Also, the current standards framework is extremely complex, and I've got to say even mysterious after eight months in post, I'm just about being able to navigate around it. To that end, then, I have a standards group in place working on simplifying the standard framework to demystify it. This comprises some of the industry specialists and leads across England and Wales. Now, I completely get that if you're looking for information on standards, it can be bewildering. I will be, in due course, setting out a list of relevant standards on my website. Now, security is also of paramount importance. You need a system in place that's secure, so no one can compromise it or the data that's stored. How do you make sure only authorised people can use the system? Is it password protected? Can you see who's accessed the system and when? If you're using wireless networks, what do you have in place? to maintain the integrity of the connection to ensure it can't be lost or hacked? And do you evaluate the performance of your system to make sure it's still effective? I've heard stories of a camera put up in winter, but by the summer it's useless as the view's now obscured by a tree. This is not surveillance by consent. Now systems should be reviewed regularly, as we've seen from the last poll, at least annually. This is to make sure cameras and systems remain necessary and justified, which is a legal requirement. This will ensure that the system is being used for its intended purpose, as well as help you see if you can decommission any cameras or actually need to increase coverage. Does your system support law enforcement and provide data that's of evidential value? And are the police easily able to export data from your system that can be used as evidence in court? And can your system and time and date stamp the images that are downloaded? Is the quality good? And it's essential that any digital images that are likely to be shared with law enforcement are in a format that can be exported, stored, and analyzed without any loss to the forensic integrity. So finally, on the principles, we are seeing technology advance at the speed of light, 0 to 60 in the flash. Facial recognition is now more prevalent. And whilst I expect that probably none of you are yet using this technology, it is around the corner. And it matches images against a reference database looking for matches, used in casinos to identify high worth customers. I know the FBI are using it, and the UK Police Force have started to trial it. Uh, Europol has started to develop um, terms of reference to, for cross-referencing across 190 subscribers to the Europol community. So this is technology that's coming in. So I mention it as these databases must be kept up to date and regularly assessed to ensure the data is fit for purpose. I'm going to give my voice a break for a wee minute and ask you another polling question. 
So fingers to the button, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this question is on standards. Not a trick question again, so please do answer, and anonymity as ever. Does your camera system meet any British, European, or international standards? Please select one of the following. Check A for yes, check B for no, and check C for don't know. And please remember to press submit. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got some answers in. So, does your camera system meet any British, European, international standards? Yes, we have 43%. No, 3%. And don't know, 54%. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, it's a very broad question, so I expect the answers to be broad. Clearly, those that can answer yes probably are in a stronger position in terms of understanding the efficiency and effectiveness of their systems. Those who have been honest enough to answer no or don't know, it's a pretty clear indication that either A, there's standards out there that you should be adopting and your systems will be more transparent, efficient and effective, or B, the standards are so confusing to access and understand that the community that needs them is not clear where to go. And, and as the Surveillance Camera Commissioner, I am acutely aware of that observation, which is why I'm running the standards workshop with a view to develop a cradle to justice framework system so that hopefully if we were to do this webinar next year, we'd be able to touch more towards the 100% yes standard. So thank you very much for that. Moving on, <clears throat> why adopt the code? So I'll ask this question, why would you want to voluntarily adopt the code if you're not a relevant authority? You may be thinking to yourself, well, okay, there's quite a lot of things I need to comply with. But I think if you've got a good system in place, you'll probably be meeting most of the principles. I mentioned at the start of the webinar that security is now becoming a factor in deciding where a student will go to study. Particularly from a parent's point of view, even more so, there's a student coming from the UK from overseas. <clears throat> it's also a factor where you go to shop or where you live for residential social landlords. So by adopting the code, it visibly enables you to show prospective students and their parents that you use CCTV in a transparent, proportionate and ethical way. It shows that you're serious about security in your campus, whilst also factoring in students' right to privacy and their human rights. It can help you to ensure that your systems are running effectively. Regular reviews will help you identify ineffective cameras or where you may need to deploy additional cameras. Cost savings and power size come to mind. It will instill confidence in those being protected that's been done proportionately, that any data captured is done securely and only viewed by designated operators. So adoption of the code will enable you to be transparent with the public about the use of cameras and we encourage anyone adopting the code to publicise the fact. I mentioned standards and if you're meeting any standards such as uh, British Standard 7958, Management of CCT Operations Room, put this information on your website. Your system may be certified by the NSI or SSIAB. Again, this is something you should not hide away. Tell people. And I want to talk about self-assessment. <clears throat> and I guess this is part of the payload for me of this webinar. I fully appreciate that adoption of the code is something that you will have to think about. And each of you will have different reasons for adoption. Each of you may also not currently know where you are in terms of meeting the principles in the code. <clears throat> To help organisations see where they are in relation to compliance, we've launched an easy to use self-assessment tool. It's an interactive PDF document and can be downloaded from my site on the gov.uk. It can be saved and completed. Now this tool has been developed in partnership with certification bodies, the SSAIB and NSI, and tested thoroughly with CCTV managers and operators. 
As I just said, it will enable organisations to show how closely they comply with the principles in the code, as well as help them identify where they may need to make adjustments. It will help them to open an action plan to set out what they need to do where they're falling short. I certainly don't expect or want it to be war and peace. There's a limit on how much text can be typed into the document for that very purpose. The tool could be a great way to have internal discussions about meeting the principles, but more than that, I want organisations to publish their self-assessment once completed. Publish it on your website. Why? Well, this will show that you're serious about being transparent and open. You're serious about privacy. That you're serious about using CCTV responsibly. I've just returned from European um, uh, research studies where privacy is utmost and centre in the thoughts of Europe and potential moving forward of um, policies and possibly uh, consideration by the Commission and next year new regulations. So privacy is key to up my heart. The tool has been developed for you. You don't have to send it completed back to me. My team's too small, it wouldn't be able to cope. But we do welcome feedback on the tool. How does it to compete? Do you understand the questions and can we make it easier for you? So what's next? Please complete the self-assessment tool and publish it if that's something that you want to do. Start to look at our code and see where you can incorporate parts into your own policies and codes where it's appropriate. And if you're complying with the code, do you know what? Publicise it. We're keen to carry out case studies with organisations who are adopting the code. So if you are one, get in touch with us. I'd like to adopt a case study, perhaps put on my website, and start to raise the standards of this industry uh, across the piece. Okay, the third and final polling question. Ladies and gentlemen, fingers at the ready. Um, the usual rules apply, anonymity. The question is, do you think your institution is fully compliant with the code? Please select one of the following and click on submit. Check A for yes, B for partially, and C for no. And please don't forget to press the submit button. Do you think your institution is fully compliant? Yes, 31%. Partially, 54%. And no, 11%. But I have to say, given that most of the attendees are from non-relevant authorities, I find that particularly reassuring. What I'd also like to say is that as a direction of travel, I aim to use 7958 and the self-assessment tool as a vehicle for organisations to acquire the Surveillance Camera Commissioner's count mark. Those who are hitting 31 and 54% may find themselves either in the position or not too very far of being able to successfully apply for it. Those who are partially succeeding, perhaps developing a 12-month action plan or two-year action plan for uh, greater compliance. So that's good news. Those who are sitting outside, I, I guess I would say that um, the benefits to companies and organisations are clear. It helps you to demonstrate the transparency that's so key, keep the public on side, make sure that you're data protection compliant, and actually you can show visible success as to how professional your organisation is. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the answers to the poll. Um, I'm now going to um, go and answer some questions that have been coming through. The slide that's up in front of you is my email. Please feel free to contact the office. Please note the Twitter. We, we tweet quite regularly with issues in relation to CCTV and have a fairly dynamic engagement. Please make reference to that, and you can see my website there. So I've got some questions from uh, delegates. Um, question, is signage sufficient? Um, no, the current standard for signage, but the minimum we'd look for is signage that indicates surveillance cameras are in operation and where to go for more information. I suppose remembering that transparency, not just about advertising cameras in use, it's also about what you do with the data. You might also consider publicising your data management retention policies. So um, 
thank you very much for that question. Um, I've also got a question here. Why do you and the ICO have two separate codes of practice? It's confusing. Now, I can see how it can be seen as confusing. I do work very closely with the Information Commissioner. We have a memorandum of understanding in place. Indeed, the recent relate release of uh, the document in the picture, those that have had the opportunity to read it, will see that the Surveillance Camera Code of Practice and Protection and Freedoms Act runs right the way through that document. And we will also see British standards now moving to subsume the 12 guiding principles, BS 7958, uh, to be just one. I do, however, hold an aspiration to harmonise the two codes. Um, but as I'm a new regulator on the block, I think this conversation to be had to look for what the industry needs are and indeed what the different needs of the regulator. So I am alive to the issues that come out from this. Thank you very much for the question. Um, thank you for answering my question in the webinar. No, no, sorry about that. What are the rules around sharing videos of theft damage with the individuals or the police? Well, as I said earlier, if you have a, um, uh, a policy around engagement with law enforcement, then provided it's for um, uh, uh, something that is deemed to be relevant under the Data Protection Act, and if there's a theft or a damage, then that would certainly seem to fall within that, then there is uh, no issues in relation to showing that to the police. Um, most of these issues are fairly well thought through and most certainly public space TCTV rooms have very clear policies on that. I'm not sure which organisation you're from so I can't go into the fine grained detail but under the Data Protection Act you are enabled to do that. Um, I've got another question here. You said only councils and police forces must pay due regard what you're doing about other sectors. Thanks very much for that. Um, it's right, every local authority in the police must pay due regard, but the Act puts on me the burden of encouraging the voluntary sector to move forward. It also puts the burden on me to advise ministers as to whether this form of regulation, the encouragement review and advice, is sufficient to raise the standards. But we'll see, from self-assessment to certification, the kite mark, I expect to see a tidal flow in the direction of elevated standards. But if we don't see that, then I would be looking towards the low-hanging fruit. Those organisations that have a mass of CCTV cameras that sit outside local authority, relevant authority, police, and start to look at how and why perhaps they should move towards uh, the duty to have regard to the code. Um, as you can see from today, we're engaged predominantly with the university sector and welcoming other sectors. I have on my radar from the non-voluntary side, the, uh, or from the voluntary side, residential social landlords, commercial retail, some education establishments, certainly across the piece transport uh, sectors that fall outside of local authorities, but in my word, walk in the shoes of local authorities. So they receive a lot of funding from that area, but aren't in fact classed as local authorities. That actually causes me some concern, so I'll be having a look at that. Um, and I've got another question here, um, just looking at the time, make sure that we, we're compliant with our time slot. Some of my guards and staff are using body-worn video. Does your code apply to body-worn video? Thank you for the question. Yes, it does. Body-worn video, automatic number plate recognition, automatic facial recognition, drones, surveillance cameras, all falls within my code. Uh, I'm not clear from the organisation who you are, uh, but if you're a relevant authority, uh, it falls within and you have a duty to have a car regard to the code. Um, this area causes me some concern. I'm seeing the explosion of its use amongst various sectors, whether they're environmental officers, housing officers, librarians, I've heard, fire staff, and the opportunity and capacity for breaching an individual's privacy seem to me somewhat enhanced by the use of body-worn video. I've paid very close focus to the police in the early days of their pilots and visited some metropolitan forces. Um, but uh, I, it, there is, a, I think, a, a much larger piece of work in terms of addressing the, the um, sectors that fall outside of the relevant authority. But 
I intend to I intend to develop the self assessment tool for those organisations as well, and they're very much on my radar. So thank you very much for that. I'll just see if there are any other questions here. So the main complaints we receive are about using CCTV for the possible monitoring of staff performance and car parking enforcement. Any views? Yes, I do. I have a lot of views. Let's just take monitoring staff performance and let me be specific I guess there was a lot of reports about use in education um, where teachers weren't sure what the cameras were there for was it there to monitor their performance or was it there to monitor the behavior of the um, children or young adults in the class my concern is this if the process such as within the 12 guiding principles hasn't been followed or had been followed rather you wouldn't end up in this position because the person that operates of the systems would have defined the, the pressing and legitimate aim that person would have been transparent about why those cameras were in place there would have been consultation with the teachers and the staff and the parents and the board of governors and there would have been a privacy impact assessment so i'm very clear that this type of process Process needs to be properly managed it needs to be managed in a way that reflects the principles within the code and, and this is one of the reasons why as I've identified earlier if it falls outside of a relevant authority I think as surveillance camera commissioner I've got the right to, to pass comment and observations thank you very much for the question and another question is okay um, are police officers permitted to attend a secure area such as a CCTV control room to review incidents in brief without submitting a DPA form to the owner beforehand. What I would say is the police aren't allowed to go anywhere unless they've been invited onto the premises by the person who's got the lawful right to either invite them on or otherwise. And I think that is, is, is the starting point. I think the next point is there are, there are a myriad of reasons why the police might want to enter the room. It could be to view on behalf of the Ripper application, which for those who, who aren't aware is a covert directed surveillance. Then there would have been some prior discussion uh, leading into that, so that question might well be redundant. Um, but if it goes into review instance without submitting a DPA, um, I think if there's a, an, an MOU in place and there, there are reasons that um, are germane and it's actually written down within the reasons the CCTV system has been put in place, I don't think they do have to submit a DPA. Um, because one imagines that you're talking about a public space CCTV room here. That question and answer could go in a number of directions, but I think I've hit the two core areas there. Uh, is that it? Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, there's some really interesting questions there. Uh, I hope to those who have asked them, you feel that you've got a full enough question. I'd like to hand back to Sally. Uh, and Sally, thank you again for giving us your platform to, to have this uh, opportunity. Thanks, Tony. Um, it was really helpful to get that explanation about the role of the surveillance camera code of practice and the practical measures that organisations should take to ensure the use of their surveillance systems are both proportionate and transparent. It was particularly helpful to um, understand how the code is interfacing with other regulatory guidance in this area, such as the Information Commissioner's Code of Practice. And I was also quite interested to learn how annual reviews of organisations' CCTV systems can actually generate both commercial benefits as well as the parents' yeah. benefits. So that was quite interesting uh, take-home point. Um, before we draw today's webinar to a close, I just wanted to flag up uh, the date of our next webinar, which will be in the new year on the 20th of January 2015, and it will be on the topic of managing cyber security risks. So that's the 20th of January 2015, managing cyber security risks. With that, uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope you've had a very, you have a very relaxing festive break, and uh, I, we look forward to you joining us in the new year. Thank you.